Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Sunday morning service, a tradition unlike any other. We'll be heading right back into a time of worship soon, but before we do that, we have a couple of announcements. If it's your first time checking us out here this morning, we would love to get connected with you. If you wouldn't mind, we would love it if you would fill out one of our Connect cards. You can find those online on our website, atchurch.org, or you can find them in the pew in front of you. Essentially, if you've ever wanted to learn something like how to get baptized here at ATC, or if you're interested in starting something like a home Bible study, this is the resource for you. And we'd also love it if you would join us on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. for our midweek services. However, if you're unable to join us for one of those services or any of our services, we do live stream them all. And you can find that on our Facebook page, on our website, and also on our YouTube page. So be sure to check those out. And we want to thank you for your continued giving, whether that's online on the Church Center app or in person in the black boxes at the back of the sanctuary. And real quick, we have a video from our friends over at Church Center explaining how to give on Online. Let's check it out. We've set up a simple way for you to give to our church online. If you want to give a quick gift, enter an amount, select a fund, then enter your email address and your first and last name. Then enter your payment details and click Give. And that's it! We'll send a receipt to your email address. To use a saved payment method or manage a recurring donation, you'll want to log in. Click the login button and we'll send a code to your phone or email account. Verify the code and you're in. Now your payment info is ready to go when you want to make a donation. To manage your giving details, switch over to the My Giving page. Here you'll see more ways you can give. You can also add a payment method, a bank account or a debit card, set up a recurring donation, and view your giving history. Again, if you want to give online, you can do so on the Church Center app, or if it's in person, we do have boxes at the back of the sanctuary. And now we're getting ready to head right back into a time of worship. So let's all stand, and let's get ready to have an incredible service. Here we go.
Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. In the name of Jesus. How many of you know there's more? There's more. You will never exhaust the full scope of his power, his majesty. Lord, I want to see more of your glory. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Doesn't get old, does it? When we're in the presence of the Lord worshiping like this, this is what I live for, to worship Jesus Christ. God bless you. Please greet someone near you. If you don't know someone, please introduce yourself to them. Thank you so much for joining us online today. Whether you're at home or you're traveling or you're checking out our church for the first time, we're grateful that we get to spend some time with you today. Apostolic Truth Church is a growing and thriving, vibrant community of believers that love Jesus. It's our mission at ATC to know Jesus, to grow in Jesus, and to show the love of Jesus. We have services every Sunday at 8.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. and also on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. We hope that you enjoyed worship today and we're about to hear some biblical teaching followed by a powerful time of prayer. If you have any questions about our church or would like to pray with someone, feel free to reach out to us and we would love to be in communication with you. We're in a series entitled Voices. We've been talking about the voices that are speaking in our world. And today I want to talk to you about the voices of our pastors. Would you pray with me? Jesus, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Lord, you have washed us. You filled us with your spirit. You just allowed us really to sit in heavenly places, enjoying your presence, enjoying worship like this. Is, it's supernatural. And now we're asking God that there would just be power in the ministry of your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. <clears throat> in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2, we're going to be reading this whole passage in a moment, so we won't read it immediately. But this passage refers to the church as being the flock of God. And verse four refers to Jesus Christ as being our chief shepherd. And the church, of course, rightly belongs to almighty God. He purchased the church with his own blood. He gave himself for it, and he is the authority over the church. And God's blueprint for building his church includes using certain saints in the office of the five-fold ministry and we read about this in Ephesians chapter 4, in, the, in verse 11. And the Bible says, and he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Everybody say the fivefold ministry. Yeah, the fivefold ministry. And the apostle governs, the prophet guides, the evangelist gathers, the teacher grounds, and the pastor guards. And we need the whole of the fivefold ministry for the church. And so we do our very best to make sure that we bring people who represent the fivefold ministry to this pulpit because we understand that pastor doesn't represent all of the fivefold ministry. So the pastor shares the responsibility along with the fivefold ministry to equip the flock for the work of ministry and to build up the body of Christ. Looking at the next verse, the scripture says what the, the purpose of the fivefold ministry is for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. This is the purpose of the fivefold ministry. Now, I'm entitling this message, the 
the voices of our pastors. Everybody say our pastors. Because ATC doesn't just have one pastor. At ATC, we have a stable of pastors, shepherds, to accomplish this work of the fivefold ministry of equipping the saints for ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. And when you study the scripture in the New Testament, you will see that elders and pastors are almost interchangeable ideas in their writings. So it would be accurate to consider our pastor team elders. The pastor is first an elder, and along with the other elders, the pastor is responsible to do several things. First Peter chapter 5, there's a, um, a scripture that pertains to the elders. The elders who are among you, I exhort. I, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, look what he says to elders, pastors, Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you. Everybody say shepherd. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So notice when Peter uh, references pastors or elders, he's, he's talking about a plurality of leadership. And he views himself as being a fellow elder, a fellow elder. And he tells them to shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers. Everybody say overseers. Yeah, overseers. And so this is something that is, is special about our church family, that, that we have elders, we have pastors who are overseers. I'm not the only one who serves in a pastoral capacity here at Apostolic Truth Church. And as I'm preaching to you today about the voices of our pastors, I don't just want you to relate this message to me. Because other pastors are going to grace this pulpit. And you are going to intersect with other pastors who are part of the elder board of this church, our leaders, and they're going to speak into your lives. And I want you to apply what you're receiving through the word today to our pastor team. How many of you are thankful for a pastor team? Amen. I'm thankful for a pastor team. I appreciate our pastor team. And so... Peter says, look, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And this is, this is right in our wheelhouse. We do not view ourselves as necessarily being a top-down church. We believe what Jesus said about leaders, that the greatest among you is actually the servant. So we view ourselves as being under the church, supporting the church, serving the church. And we don't have that top-down mindset. Now, God has given us authority, but he's given us that authority with the mindset of servant leadership to serve our church family. So not being lords over, but being examples to the flock. That's a responsibility of pastoral leadership. Not just how we lead, but how we lead, live our lives is very important. In Ephesians chapter 4, we read in verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing one another in love. So this is a call to the entire church because we are, all have callings and we all have a purpose to fulfill. But especially pastors, there is this call for us to walk worthy of our calling. And so we have privilege but we also have responsibility. We have the opportunity to preach, but we also need to example what we preach to you. And I'm thankful for the pastoral voices in my life. My first pastor was Brother William Dix. And um, well, he was, my earliest memories involved Pastor Dix. And he was a preacher. He was powerful. In fact, my mom and dad and I sat together uh, I don't know, maybe a month or two ago and, and listened to one of the cassette tapes 
of one of his leadership classes. This guy was doing leadership classes back in the 70s and equipping, equipping saints for the work of ministry. I remember his preaching. I remember what he smelled like because he always wore the same cologne. And if I would love to know whatever it was because that would be a great memory to just say, yep, that's him. <laughs> I remember shaking his hand. He was not a mechanic. And he had soft hands. I remember that. I remember just the honor of, of, of having conversations with him as a little boy and him patting my shoulder, patting my head. And I'm not trying to... Uh, aggrandize the role of pastor, but just to say that uh, my life is filled with, with fond memories about pastoral leadership in my life. And then my father um, took his very first and only pastorate in Clintonville, Wisconsin. My dad was my pastor, and my dad broke the bread and, and served our church. We saw revival happen in Clintonville, Wisconsin under his tremendous leadership and his, uh, his servant mindset did some things that people said could never be done in Clintonville, Wisconsin. And it was a beautiful thing, and I'm so grateful. And then I asked our former bishop, John E. Putnam, to be that centerpiece voice in my life, to be a, a pastoral shepherding bishop voice in my life. And so I appreciate having him in my life. So every one of these pastors have shaped my life. William Dix was a foundational voice. Brother John Putnam is a guiding voice, and my father and my mother continue to be a covering voice in my life. And I can't tell you what a blessing it's been to my life to have a pastor. And I am a composite of these people. And I'm here in large part because I just had great leaders and great pastors in my life. And I want you to understand that pastors have no authority apart from God, the authority of his word, and the authority of scripture that is ascribed to pastors and elders. But ultimately, the authority is in the word of God, not the man. So it's very important that pastors stay in the book. And the church said, amen. amen. The word pastor means shepherd. And according to scripture, a shepherd feeds the flock, right? That's right. It's important to put the sheep on the grass, lead you to the grass and to feed you the word of God, to break the bread of life, to rightly divide the word, to feed the flock of God. A shepherd guides the flock. Sometimes, um, you know, there's, there are storms, there are predators, there are wolves, and it's important that the shepherd guides the flock through those moments. And of course, a shepherd guards the flock from those wolves, guards the flock of God from predators. A shepherd cares for the flock. So sometimes there's, there's struggle. Sometimes there's, there are wounds that happen in life. There are, there are treacherous things that, that are perpetrated against believers. And it's, it's a shepherd's responsibility to, to show that care and to give that TLC and, and to offer those special prayers and that special counsel to that sheep that needs a little extra. And sometimes... By reference of the word of God, I see that sometimes a shepherd even goes looking for a lost sheep. And to clarify, shepherds don't go looking for goats, they look for sheep. And so not everybody who leaves church wandered. Some people who leave church did it with their eyes wide open. And they are self-willed. And they're, it's, it's the prodigal son mindset. And, and they're going to a far country and, and they think they know what they're doing and they break down the fence line of, of God's word. And for those people like the prodigal son, they have to come home. The prodigal uh, father did not go looking for his son. He just left the light on for him. In church, we're leaving the light on for some prodigals. Amen. We're leaving the light on for him. But yes, there are some sheep who are wayward. And so a pastor may have to go have a very important critical conversation with someone because they see that wandering and they, they want to, to help them find their way home. The pastor's voice. It works for you in this generation where there's so much confusion and chaos and so many lies and so much danger. A pastor's voice is speaking for you. And the first way that a pastor's voice is speaking for you is prayer. Everybody say Prayer. 
I want you to know that our pastors pray for you. In fact, we gather together uh, before we have staff meetings and, and we have a time of prayer here in this sanctuary before we gather for our meeting. And we use this time to lift up and to pray for the body. And we thank God as Paul did. And I was, um, I've always admired Paul. He was a, uh, just a great, had a great shepherd's heart. And I knew that Paul, I, I remembered that, you know, Paul has prayed many prayers for the church. And so I started digging around and really it was more uh, than I anticipated. It was more than I had time to really get into. But just in a nutshell, what I'm seeing from a pastor's heart of prayer, and I find agreement with this, Paul, first of all, thanked God for the church, for the people of God. And he said in Philippians, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. And so he's thanking the Lord for the church, the body of Christ. And that's certainly a pastor's prayer. It's a prayer of thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege to serve this church family. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be a part of this church family. If I weren't the lead pastor, I would still want to go here. Okay, because I love this church family. Secondly, we see Paul prayed for wisdom and knowledge for the people of God. Colossians 1 and 9. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. There are times when we see uh, people going through things, but God has not released us to engage. We don't engage every situation we see, but we do pray. And so when we don't feel that release to engage, we're praying this prayer, Lord, give that family wisdom and give them knowledge. You know, God hears us when we pray. And so we pray that for you. A pastor's voice is speaking over you. Asking the Lord to give you wisdom and knowledge. Thirdly, Paul prayed that they would be full of hope. That you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. In a world of adversity, we don't want you to lose hope. Because we have a living hope. This isn't a hopeful hope. This isn't just some, well, hopefully things are going to get better. I promise you, we're going to turn the page one day and we're going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ and don't be weary in well-doing. We pray that you would live in peace and unity. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify God our, and our Father, our Lord, Jesus Christ. We pray for the unity of the church. You know, unity gets challenged in a church. If the devil is going to undermine the church, it's going to be at the place of unity. Right? A house divided can't stand. And so we pray for our unity. We pray that the Lord will help us to, 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 to fight for that unity. Paul prayed that the church will be strengthened with spiritual power that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Colossians 1.11, may you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. And I have the habit as your pastor, when I pray in this place, I, I have the habit of remembering where you sit. Some of you are creatures of habit and I remember where you sit. And so I will, I will think about you when I walk by that pew and I will pray, God, empower that family, empower that life. I pray that for the different age groups of our church community, I pray for our children and protection. I pray for the protection of our schools, that there's no evil that is perpetrated against our schools. I pray for our teens. I pray for our college students, our young adults. I pray for our young families. I pray for our core families. I pray for our guardians. We pray that you would be empowered. This is a voice that's speaking for you. And it's not just my voice, but a stable of shepherds are praying for you. Okay? When you wake up in the morning, you just need to know prayers are coming your way. We pray that you would comprehend the love of God. Paul prayed this, that you 
may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, length, height, depth, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the knowledge of God. We pray that you would understand that because some people are dealing with the spirit of condemnation and you feel like there's no way back. You feel like that you're never going to have victory and you're looking at, you become the accuser of the brethren. You're doing the devil's job. You accuse yourself. And so a prayer that we would pray for you is that you would understand the love of God. We pray that your love would grow for others. Philippians 1.9, and it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more. We pray for your righteousness and for your purity. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. We pray for your purity. One of the pastoral prayers that cover this congregation is for the integrity of our marriages. People are just giving up on their marriages. People are betraying their vows that they made. And so we pray that the hand of the Lord will be upon you, that you will not fall into any snare or deception. These are pastoral voices that are being raised for you. Paul prayed for opportunities to minister. As we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see your face, see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Paul prayed for opportunities to, to give direction. And sometimes that is our prayer too for you. Because we feel like maybe in the moment the bank isn't open for deposits. And if the bank's not open for deposits, it's, it's not real wise to try to move on in and give pastoral direction because the bank's not open. So it's like, Lord, open that heart. Prepare that heart. Let there be a longing, a desire. Give me an opportunity, Lord, to plant seed, to have a conversation. Everybody say prayer. prayer. We're talking about the pastoral voice. Prayers are being made from you, from your shepherds. And then encouragement and counsel. Write that down, note takers. Encouragement and counsel. This is something else that comes from our shepherds. This is important. Don't ever underestimate how powerful a conversation with your shepherd can be. If you are in turmoil, if you're struggling, if you're in a valley, if, if, if you are confused, don't hesitate to reach out to our pastors. Have a conversation. I hear people say, well, pastor, you know, I would, I would uh, you know, talk with you, but I know you're busy. And, and here's the idea. The idea is, this is why I'm here. This is why we're here, to have conversations with you. We want to prioritize you. You can schedule a meeting. You can call the office and you can say, I'd like to schedule a meeting with Pastor Soto. I'd like to schedule a meeting with Pastor Hoffman. And you know what? Our shepherds, they are, they are some blessed, wise people. And maybe for whatever reason, you don't feel to have a conversation with me, but one of our other pastors, that's okay. You're not going to hurt my feelings. But you need sometimes your, to hear your pastor's voice and receive that critical encouragement and counsel in those seasons of your life. I want to tell you that when we sit down and we have conversations, more often than not, the gifts of the Spirit operate. And what I mean by that is when, when pastors have conversations with you, I'm not going to tell you that we're always speaking as an oracle of the Lord, okay? We're not always, you know, speaking as an oracle of the Lord because we like to talk about the Packers every once in a while. And sometimes we just really need to listen and then we need to pray. We don't have a, a rhema word in the moment. But many times, spiritual gifts operate and there's the discerning of spirits. Discernment is happening while we're having a conversation. There's divine wisdom. It's not coming from my mind or our pastor's minds, but it's just a wisdom that comes from God to clarify the situation. 
to give direction. And there's the word of knowledge. All of these things can happen. The gifts of the Spirit can operate in these moments where you intentionally seek out the pastor's voice. The Lord can use that moment to bless you. Don't isolate yourself. Don't isolate yourself. We're here to serve you. We want God to use us, to flow through us, to be a blessing to your life. If we need to talk, let's talk. And if you don't want to talk because you don't want us to know that you're flawed, we already know. We already know. And you already know that we're flawed, right? So there's a culture of grace. There's a culture of mercy here. When your pastor speaks into your life, I believe that through that prayerful conversation, there's clarity that could come to your confusion. There's direction. So after we've had that conversation, pray about it. Pray about it. Seek the Lord and then apply that to your life. Encouragement. Counsel. And then correction. We need that. I need that. Pastors, guard. Pastors, guard. And so sometimes there's correction that needs to come from the pulpit, not necessarily to somebody in particular, but just to address a climate or a spiritual attack that's happening. Okay? And so there's clarification and correction that needs to happen because maybe there's a doctrine that's trying to come in and unseat people off of the foundation of the Word of God. Have you guys seen the videos of these interceptor missiles going up the Iron Dome over Israel? And I believe there's almost a hundred uh, missiles and drones that were sent by I Iran to, you know, to bring destruction to Israel. And the U.S. and Israel sent up these interceptors and just blew them out of the sky. I believe the percentage was 99%. And so that's amazing. Well, just, just think... That if the devil's trying to send in false doctrine, if the devil's trying to send in a lie, if the devil's trying to introduce destruction into the body of Christ, thank God for pastors who will say, we're going to intercept that. We're going to speak to that with clarity and we're gonna, not going to allow destruction to come and land on the people of God. That's an important conversation. It's important for pastors to use their voice in those moments. Titus 1 and 9, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Correction is in the Bible. Church said amen. In Galatians chapter 6, the scripture says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, so restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. So here's a call. Hey, if somebody's overtaken in trespass, there has to be a voice that speaks. There has to be something that is deployed to bring about restoration in the right spirit. Amen. And with a spirit of gentleness. So when and if this ever happens where this isn't a general thing, but a pastor's voice is speaking to you for the purpose of correction, I want to challenge you, receive that. Receive it. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 11. And have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons? My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourge, scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. 
For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? That's a good question, right? If, if father never corrects, that's not loving. That's not loving. But if you are without chastening, of which you all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed, for a few days, chastened us as seems best to them, but he for our profit that we may be partakers in holiness. This is the, the purpose of correction, to bring about holiness in our lives. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Correction can be painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. If a pastor's voice speaks correction to your life, understand the goal is to bring about holiness and righteousness in your life. We will do our very, very best to help you to understand that we're trying to confront the sin or the error. It's not a rejection of you. To correct means that we accept you and love you enough to bring correction to you. My son works at the YMCA and he works with kids and he works with a lot of kids in the mornings and the afternoons and in the evenings. And uh, he, he has an opinion about parenting now. <laughs> he has a perspective and he's let me know, dad, there are problems. Dad, did you know that there are problems? And he's telling me about a boy and a girl, their brother and sister. And he's like, dad, it, they, they're just messing everything up. There's like... <laughs> It, it just, it makes it bad for everybody because they don't behave, they don't listen, they get upset, they're just, and he's like, dad, somebody needs to talk to their parents. Now, there's a young man who's actually thinking because sometimes when you see the child, it's a reflection, it's a parental reflection, it's, it's, it's a reflection of parenting. And he strongly suspects that somebody needs to talk to these parents. And I encouraged him, it's not you, it's not you. <laughs> Amen. You have to decide what you're going to do with pastors. You have to decide what category we're going to be in in your life. Are we just preachers on Sundays or do we really have permission to be shepherds to you? And it seems like this is manifested most when correction comes. Hebrews 13, 17, obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account, let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Submit yourselves. Not my job to submit you. Okay? It's not my job. It's not the pastor's job to submit you. We're supposed to feed the flock. We're supposed to feed, guide, guard. It's your job to submit. You determine. In the kingdom of God, obedience is always a requirement. The Apostle Paul stated that obedience was a proof of the believer in 2 Corinthians 2 and 9. For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. This is something that we all have to live out. I want you to know that when I am not preaching and someone else is preaching from behind this pulpit, one of our pastor team members, and I'm sitting there, you need to know that I'm submitted to that office of the preacher. And I'm receiving that word. I'm not, I don't have a critical spirit. I assume God's talking to me. And I want to harvest what has been preached. That's why I, I always say, if you're a note taker, I have some pastor friends of mine who are like, you know, that's a powerful suggestion you make all the time. You know, they're like, I've been listening to your sermons and you are always saying, if you're a note taker and you're suggesting that people take notes, that's absolutely right. If you're a note taker, in other words, you might want to write this down because this is kind of important. But look, you don't have to write down point A, B, or C, but what is the Spirit saying to you from the preaching? Harvest that. I like to take notes when I hear preaching. 
And then I like to go over it the next day or in my devotion time, take a look at what, uh, what the Lord said through preaching and what applies to me and pray about that and, and just, you know, devour the word, but digest the word through, through that, that stewardship of the preaching of the word of God. So I want you to know that we all have pastors in our lives, including me. And there's going to be a day if the Lord tarries and, and if we can continue to be good dance partners, that Pastor Hoffman's going to be my pastor. He's going to be the lead pastor of this church. And I'm going to be submitted to him as my lead pastor. And so I'm going to have to example this as we continue. But for now, we practice mutual submission on our pastor team. And I'm not trying to confuse you. There's one vision coming from me. And, and I am the lead pastor of this church. But I'm a man under authority. And I respect the office of pastor. And when I'm not standing here, I want to be submitted to the preach word of God. As the musicians come. Do you remember that story where Samuel... Here's his name. He's just a little boy. He lives in the house of the Lord. Samuel. And he's like, that sounds like my pastor. He goes to Eli. Did you call me? I just think it's interesting that the voice of God sounded like Samuel's pastor, his priest. And I'm not trying to elevate my voice and say that it is the rhema. But I am saying you should be listening for the voice of God and should know. That's, that sounds like a little something like what my pastor says. Can you hear your pastor's voice? Can you hear God in my voice? We should be declaring his inspired word as pastors. And so when we preach, we're not just trying to lecture to you we're trying to feed you and it's your responsibility when you hear preaching to eat it's my job to feed you but i can't make you eat do you ever have a strong-willed child and you said you're going to stay there there till you eat it and then you wished you hadn't said it i had a strong-willed cousin he's probably watching right now because he regularly watches you know who you are but one time my aunt said, you are going to sit at this table until you eat that. And I thought, you don't want to do that. And he sat there. This was back in the day when in, in Dubuque, we had two services, morning and evening service. He stayed there until the evening service. I took a nap. I woke up. He's still sitting there. I'm not going to eat it. Folks, I can't make you eat this. But when a pastor's prayed and they're bringing the word, breaking the bread, it's so important that you just say, thank you, God, for a voice. In this world of confusion, thank you for clarity that's coming from the inspired word of God. I receive it, Lord. Would you stand with me? Amen. Amen. We're going to keep preaching the word. We're going to keep preaching this word to you. There are a lot of voices in this generation, but you need a pastor's voice. And don't take it lightly. It's a sacred thing. When someone who's prayed and studied stands behind this pulpit, wants to feed you. God wants us to hear his voice through preaching. Lord, I thank you for the pastors who have served in my life. And thank you for the messages that they've brought. Just like meals, Lord, I don't remember every meal, but it got me here. I don't remember every sermon, but Lord, they brought me here. There are some sermons I'll never forget. 
There's some pastoral conversations I will never forget that were revelatory and groundbreaking. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us the fivefold ministry. And thank you, Lord, for that guardian calling of pastor shepherds. I pray, Lord, in this world that likes to diminish the role of pastors and dismiss spiritual authority, that we would stand with the word of God and that we would be a church that has a collective yes in our heart for the preaching of the word, for the counsel that we receive, for the correction that we receive, knowing God that it brings about righteousness and holiness in our life. I pray this in the awesome name of Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you, church, this is a great opportunity for you to come down to not just pray and say, Lord, I just want to have a right heart towards the pastoral ministry of our church, but to pray for your pastors. We covet your prayers. Don't think for a minute the devil's not waging war against us, our families. If the devil can get the pastors, he's got a lot of people with him. And so there is an attack on spiritual leadership. Would you pray for us? I want to open this altar for you to come and to receive the word of God and to just make a commitment to the hearing of the word of God in Jesus' name. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Yes, Lord, in Jesus' name, hallelujah Thank you, Lord For the voice, Lord, of shepherds Thank you, Jesus Help me, Lord, not to be dismissive. Help me, Lord, to have an open heart to receive the preached word of God. Thank you, Lord. Give grace to our pastors to preach the gospel. It is the power of God and the salvation to break the bread of life, Lord. In Jesus' name, let there be a hedge of protection around their homes, around their children. Lord, restore virtue, God, that they expand in service to your kingdom. Bless our pastors, God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, may our pastors be in unity. May our pastors, Lord, fight that good fight of faith. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You are faithful, Lord. You have blessed us, God. Your voice, you have led me through the fire in darkest times. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. You have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will see of the goodness of God 
so much for joining us online for service. We hope that today has been a blessing to you. We hope that it has been equipping and strengthening to you, maybe even your whole family. If you're looking for a church in the Appleton area, let's connect. We would love to learn more about your story. We believe that it is our mission to know Jesus, to grow in Jesus, and to show the love of Jesus. So if you're looking to connect, if you want prayer, if you want to get plugged into a life group, if you're wanting to learn more about baptism, it would be our pleasure to serve you. Connect with us online at atchurch.org. We're looking forward to hearing from you.